Hello. Okay, so I guess we start with this presentation. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, it's great to see that the room is almost full. Um, my name is Thomas Dinges, also known as Dingto Online. And today I'd like to uh, yeah, give you basically uh, tell you something about cycles um, and uh, yeah, talk a bit about what we have been working on in the past year since last year's Blender conference, uh, talk a bit about recent developments and uh, yeah, look a bit into the future what we will be working on in the upcoming months. Okay, so cycles just quickly, I guess everybody knows. By the way, can you hear me well? Oh, this one is also open. That's the problem. You want to shift or you want to stand? I think it's better for showing the uh, I have to find out which one. Test, test, test. Hello? That's why I'm singing because it's uh, using this microphone. Yeah. Is that on how this way? Hello, hello, hello. One, two, three. Ah, uh, that's better. Yeah, yeah that's. Ah, uh, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Ton. Okay, so just quickly, Cycles uh, is meant for uh, smaller teams and studios, so that's what we, uh, what we use basically and uh, what uh, sort of the thing uh, where we are um, using to evaluate uh, targets and uh, priorities. So Cycles is meant for production, for visual effects, for animation, and um, yeah, it's, it's not meant to be a 100% physically actual, accurate renderer, so you can render like all these fancy uh, stuff or interiors or so there. Cycles is not optimal for that, but we really try to uh, optimize it further and uh, have a, a versatile render engine which can be used in all kinds of different uh, production environments. And uh, we really focus on interactivity and ease of use, so we try not to expose a lot of uh, options in the UI, but we try to do as much as possible in the background so the user is not confronted with all kinds of different settings and algorithm options or whatsoever. So we try to keep that a bit hidden from the user. And uh, as Ton also mentioned in his uh, introduction talk this morning, is that we uh, relicensed it to Apache 2.0 uh, last year. So it can be used uh, permissively also in commercial applications. And we hope to uh, see cycles in other applications uh, in the future as well. Um, Nathan Ledvori is actually working on an integration into Rhino 3D, um, which is a, a great 3D application, and he has been working on um, on an integration for that uh, for the past few weeks. And uh, I think there are some screenshots online, uh, which you can check out uh, on Twitter, for example. So we hope to see Cycles uh, also getting used outside of Bender uh, very soon, and uh, we also want to improve the API there, so it's it's more usable for people uh, outside of Blender. Um, before I go into details and talk about the development last year, of course, one thing that we uh, should quickly mention is, of course, that uh, Cycles is there because of one man, and this man is Brecht. So, um, yeah, Brecht started uh, a new job this year, so he went to Solid Angle in Spain. Um, the guys developed the Arnold render engine, and uh, yeah, we are really missing him. Uh, and uh, but I think for him it's a really great opportunity and I think he really enjoys working there. So uh, please uh, let's have a short round of applause for Brecht and all his awesome work. <laughs> all right, so let's first talk a bit about what we have been working on in the past year since last year's Blender conference. Um, some of you might remember last year, uh, during the conference, uh, the people were still working on the Caminandes short film, Project Pampa, and uh, the consensus back then was basically, it is too slow. 
So uh, Pablo Vasquez always uh, compared it to Blender internal and said like, yeah, we can get an amazing image in two minutes and now we, it takes like two hours or so. So um, that was basically the starting point when we decided to focus on optimizations. And uh, then one developer uh, came along, uh, Mr. Local, and did a lot of great work um, on textures and hair. And that's basically what resulted in a, in a great speed up uh, from Blender 2.69 to Blender 70, um, as you can see here in the chart. So it was basically for this particular scene in uh, 1280 by 700 resolution HD, uh, it went down from 66 minutes to 46 minutes. So uh, we could get a nice speed boost there. So that was already better. Um, but we did more work. Um, Brecht von Lommel did a lot of optimizations then for 2.71, especially optimizations for, for hair again, but also transparent shadows, which is uh, heavily used in uh, scenes with hair or when you have like trees and uh, leaves with transparent textures. So as you can see here, we have uh, the Koro character uh, and the render time decreased from almost five minutes down to roughly two. So that was a big improvement back then. And uh, yeah, so basically, this uh, was the beginning of all these optimizations that we did. But also, we added a lot of uh, major new features since last year, uh, especially volume rendering and smoke and fire. So we have um, basic volume rendering added for absorption, for emission, and scattering. And also, in 2.71, smoke and fire rendering. So um, yeah, you can use the full feature set with uh, cycles now when it comes to volumetrics. One important thing for animators has been, of course, deformation motion blur, which was also added a few months ago, and uh, also one big feature by the Live Elinto texture baking, especially nice for um, game artists if they want to bake their global illumination and use it in game engines, for example, or to pre-calculate stuff so uh, they can speed up render time by decreasing the bounces later on. Uh, so they first bake the GI into textures, and then they can render it faster. But uh, there's a lot more that we did in the past few weeks. Um, some of those uh, have just recently been uh, released for Blender 2.72, the release which we just did like two weeks ago or so. Um, and some of these were, for example, that we have improved glossy sampling. I'm not sure how well, I guess you can see it well on the projector. So on the left-hand side, we have uh, uh, Suzanne with uh, a glossy a shader GGX with a roughness of 0.4 and you see especially on the edges there was a lot of noise and the improved algorithm that we have now based on a paper that has been released uh, just this year you can see there's a lot less noise and uh, render time is slightly slower but uh, due to the better quality and the less noise you can actually decrease your samples so you get uh, a fine image with just 80 samples for example instead of 100 so you still have roughly the same render time if you compensate for that, but you have less noise. Uh, one thing that we also recently uh, could do is to bring volumetrics and subsurface scattering onto the GPU, something that have, people have been asking for quite a long time. But it wasn't so trivial to do that, um, because every time you add new features to the GPU, it basically gets slower, because Cycles is basically one big uh, code blob and uh, GPUs don't like these complex programs. So basically for a GPU it's better to have uh, smaller parts and uh, they are then uh, communicating with each other and uh, doing the workload. Uh, but with one mega kernel basically every time you add new features you risk a slowdown. So we had to be careful uh, not to slow it down too much and thankfully to the new CUDA toolkit, the compiler from NVIDIA, we could enable volumetrics basically for free because that compiler version made it a few percent faster. And by enabling volume, we were basically uh, back at, uh, yeah, basically. So the render time wasn't, uh, sl there was no slowdown, but we could enable volumetrics. Uh, for subsurface scattering, we actually had to split the kernel into two. So we now compiled two. Uh, CUDA kernels for each GPU architecture because when you use subsurface scattering on GPU it uses quite more memory which is a, a big problem when you have a, a GPU with just one gigabyte of uh, video memory for example 
So uh, for that kind of thing, for subsurface scattering, we recommend a GPU with two gigabyte or three gigabyte or even more, because otherwise you may hit the boundary very soon and you cannot render uh, big scenes with it. There are other things that people have been working on. Uh, Martin, for example, worked on texture interpolation options. So when you wanted to have like, uh, if you don't want it, cycles to interpolate your textures and because you want some, some kind of Minecraft style, for example, you can now disable texture interpolation, stuff like that. So that was added um, memory improvements a bit. So we don't calculate the face normal, uh, pre-calculate the, the face normal now. So this saves a few bytes per triangle. And uh, there were some improvements for um, um, Intel CPUs, the Haswell architecture. So uh, rendering on Haswell is 5% faster, approximately. And um, some other things I worked on during my Google Summer of Code this year was improved clamping. So that was something that uh, that is uh, really nice, and I got a lot of feedback about that. Is um, before you could all you could uh, just clamp your image with one slider. So Basically, with that, you could get rid of some fireflies, but at the same time, you reduced the uh, the image, um, um, the dynamic range, basically, of the image. So you got a, uh, a image which was darker then, and you, pro you don't want that usually. So I split it up into indirect and direct clamping. So now you can keep the direct highlights. So when you have a light source, for example, it's still very, very bright, shiny, but you can just clamp the indirect samples. So this way you can get rid of fireflies uh, very effectively, basically. And another thing that I added was multi-light sampling for the branched path integrator that we have. So basically, Cycles was already uh, taking all the lights in your scene into account when doing the rendering process, but just for the direct contributions. For the indirect global illumination, it still picked one lamp at random, and now it also picks every light and uh, takes it into account, which also gets rid of of noise pretty effectively. Okay, and uh, another thing that I want to mention is the great Cycles demo reel, which has been done by Alexander Mitzkos here. Um, and uh, we used great music from Jan Morgenstern. And uh, we did that demo reel for this year's FMX presentation in May. And I guess most of you have already seen it, but uh, I still try to play it back. I hope we have sound. Um, and if the internet works, yeah. So just to quickly show the great demo reel that we did this year for Cycles. So yeah, that was the demo reel, and I hope to see how how uh, versatile Cycles is being used in all kinds of productions for commercials, for animations, for uh, VFX. So that's really great, and I hope to see more of it next year. And uh, I hope to have another demo reel next year again, so we can show even more of it, uh, because there, there are a lot of things that are going on right now, and people are using Cycles more and more in animations. Also, thanks because uh, thanks to the to the fact that we are constantly working on making it faster this year, especially. So I hope to see much more animations next year being done with cycles. All right.
right, so let's uh, talk a bit about uh, upcoming changes, changes that we already did for uh, the upcoming 2.73 release and things that are that we want to work on afterwards. So a few improvements recently done by Sergei here, um, for example, improved area light sampling. So on the left side you see the old algorithm which produced a lot of, yeah, some fireflies here and it's pretty noisy here. And then with the same amount of samples with the new algorithm, you have a perfectly fine image. You have no fireflies here, and the actual area lamp here on top is uh, much more be much better. Um, render time is roughly the same. It's a bit slower, but usually when you have a, a real scene with a few area lights, that is just a, yeah, a small fraction of the of the overall computation time. So in a in a big scene, there is no big difference. Um, in scenes like that where you just have like uh, an area lamp and a sphere for example here, render time is a bit uh, yeah, noticeably uh, slower, like that was 10 seconds slower or so here. But even when you um, render with the old algorithm and increase the samples, you had the same render time with the old algorithm as well, but it was still uh, far worse in terms of noise. So you got a clean image in a short amount of time. Um, I think that was uh, roughly 100 or so, but I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah sure. That's just for area lights at the moment. Yeah, um, we probably can improve the sampling for other lamp types, uh, lamp types still, but uh, that one is uh, in particular just for area lights. Another thing that we did, uh, and look at this crappy coder art here, um, is camera inside volume support. So. Um, you, know, you now can fly through your volume object, uh, which is nice when you have things like clouds, for example, or fire, and you want to fly through it and uh, have cool animations with it. So that's possible now, which was not possible before. So you can achieve some great effects here. We have just that is just a cube with uh, three point lights and a checker texture. So you have a, a checker cube, so to speak. Um, yeah, and some other things uh, that uh, we are looking into at the moment. Uh, Sergey has been working on improved BVH to speed up the rendering process and uh, reduce memory usage a bit. So um, one thing that he implemented is the watertight paper, which basically makes uh, intersections more precise. So before that, uh, you could have some situations where the ray actually slips through when you have like an, an edge and the ray is directly going through the edge and it's then not colliding properly and then you could get like fireflies or more noise or so. Um, so um, hopefully this will be in soon, I guess, but yeah, we'll see. Um, which will make it more precise so you don't have intersection problems anymore and uh, there are actually quite a few bug reports in our tracker that we got in the past uh, two or three years, so uh, there will be quite a few precision errors that will be fixed with that. Another thing that we can look into is a uh, better improved QBVH. So you have actually uh, four leaves uh, in the BVH structure, which should improve the performance of the rendering a bit. Um, but these things are pretty tricky, and we have to still check how how much performance we can gain and which particular algorithms we are going to use. Um, another thing uh, are further sampling improvements, just like uh, the one you've just seen with the um, area lights. So there are still some things that we can do to uh, decrease noise and uh, we look into that a bit. Um, I know many people mention displacement and open subdiff for cycles, but uh, I think that is something that we probably will see next year, so I, I don't think that we will get it this year already. Uh, I could be wrong, but... <laughs> Yeah, so basically Cycles already has displacement support when you go to the experimental feature set, but that's basically unfinished and there needs some, there are some things that need to be fixed and then further improvements. So yeah, probably um, this will this will be tackled next year, so I don't think it, it fits into uh, our to-do list for this year. But uh, yeah, of course, anyone who wants to get, uh, uh, yeah, who gets started with Cycles and wants to help out is welcome. So if there's a C++ coder here who wants to get crazy with our code, uh, just talk to us and we're happy to uh, get your starting point and yeah. 
All right, so that, uh, that's it already for my um, theoretical part here of my presentation, and I, I actually didn't really prepare a lot more slides because I always find it boring when there's just someone sitting in front and talking and talking. So I actually want to spend the rest of this talk uh, giving you guys the opportunity to ask questions, uh, tell me complaints, cycles is not fast enough, and I don't know. So that's your ch chance now. So uh, if you guys have questions or want to give uh, us feedback or whatsoever, now that's uh, that's your chance. Okay. Yeah, there's something that is on our to-do list actually for quite some time. Okay. Um, so he asked uh, whether we will have uh, light groups in uh, Blender uh, in cycles, basically the same like we have in Blender internal, so you can have uh, some lights which only affect certain objects. Um, yeah, that is something that comes up quite often, and uh, I guess it will be implemented uh, once, but uh, yeah, I cannot give you an, an estimation when. Do we have a second microphone? That would be that would be perfect. Otherwise, maybe I can uh, we can pass around that one, and I can just. Something happened. Yes. Yes. Hello. Oh, perfect. Okay, in this one. Okay. So next one. So I've seen, I was very interested in this when, when this volume stuff came up and uh, then I got disappointed because I couldn't get volume textures inside. So uh, when do we really get volume textures? Because right now it's like you load a 2D texture and then it shows something up like this checker texture. But actually, well, I have a lot of volume textures. I have IRM images. I have uh, molecules that that have some electron clouds, so, something like this. So, so when can when can I go back to render this stuff? Yeah. <laughs> okay. The, the when question is actually always the most difficult one because, uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I know what you're talking about. Um, the thing is, you can have uh, different kinds of implementations. So we could have like a basic voxel texture where yeah. you can then load in stuff. Uh, but the long-term solution, I guess, is uh, to integrate OpenVDB to uh, also import those kind of things. So, uh, yeah. But I, okay. I cannot tell you when, but it's definitely going so. There's to someone working on it. That, that's 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 not basically at the moment. The but not at the moment. Okay. <laughs> yeah, but but it's definitely going to happen um, sooner or later. So yeah, I guess in the next half year or so it might be there. Yeah. Okay. Or Thanks a lot. Yeah. There is somebody on Blender Artist who has worked on a um, open shading language script. So if you have your data as you probably have slices for images, like um, if you have these image slices, then you can uh, search Blender Artist. There is somebody who has written an open shading language shader that takes a series of images um, you know, of sliced data like MRT or CT, and then it creates a volume texture from it that you can render in cycles. So it's it's possible. You you just need to work around. Good. Um, in cycles, you have to choose whether you want to render use with CPU or GPU. Will it ever be possible to use both in some way to render one uh, one scene? So at the moment, that is not. Um, yeah, well, it is possible if you use OpenCL. So when you have uh, an NVIDIA GPU, for example, and an Intel CPU, um, and you enable OpenCL for both of them, you can do it actually. But it's well, it's not optimal, so um, when you have like an NVIDIA GPU, you should use CUDA to render on it uh, instead of OpenCL because that is uh, faster. Um, so it might be possible in the future. We also want to have uh, proper network rendering, so you can okay. basically... Uh, because, uh, because usually for my uh, PC, the limitation is the memory on the GPU card. Mm -hmm. If it would be possible to, I don't know, slice the image in, in some way, 
to use one or two gigs on the GPU and use the rest to use the CPU to render the rest. Would it ever be possible to do something like that? Well, that is not really possible because it doesn't matter how um, how big the um, the part of the image is you're rendering. You still need the entire scene, the BVH, the textures on the device itself. So it doesn't matter if you just render a fraction of the image, so just a few tiles, uh, because you still need the entire data. So. Uh, you can so um, you can use multiple devices to render that with OpenCL, and hopefully also in a more proper way in the future. But you still need to have the the memory available to load the entire scene on all the devices. Otherwise okay, it's thanks. Not possible. Um, hi. Um, how about um, a shadow ray pass for mesh lights? It's still missing. Is and can we get this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, a shadow, uh, proper shadow support, and also shadow catcher and stuff like that for compositing is uh, something that is also coming up often. Is Sebastian here by any chance? No, he's not. He's asking about it all the time. And uh, yeah, it should definitely be implemented. But uh, yeah, it's just one of those items on a long to-do list. And uh, um, half year or one year. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so yeah, it's definitely an important, very important feature for our VFX artists, but yeah. We need more coders. Uh, uh, <coughs> sorry, and, uh, uh, Blender Classic was uh, uh, Starry Sky and uh, very uh, cheesy uh, uh, and miss. Was that already included? Uh, sorry? Uh, in uh, uh, all the internal uh, uh, render engine, you had uh, Starry Sky. Nobody? Ah, stars. Yeah, well, um, there's no plan to add a star right. feature to to side. It's really sleazy, but I quite kind of uh, use it lots. So, yeah. No plans. <laughs> Hi. Just a question, maybe not from uh, a more specific question. When we, for example, in cycles, render passes, and we have the normal pass. It renders the like the ob uh, fr in, in the object space or in the world space. I don't even even remember. But would it be possible to have this pass a standard way, normal way, so when the, in the camera uh, space? Because it's uh, when we are rendering the normal pass, it's uh, it's like uh, I've never heard it used. The data, you know, in the in the world spaces or something, but everybody uses the the camera, so so we need to convert it somehow. But I wouldn't want to change it. I can do it, but I would like to render passes, several passes, like have the direct, indirect, uh, diffuse, and blah blah. But I don't want that. I want to have it uh, in, you know, a multi-layer EXR, for example. And what comes as the output of the normal, I would like to have it in the camera space because everybody uses this in camera space in compositing. I've never heard anybody use a uh, normal pass that uses other space. So it, uh, th this is this is just a question. Um, if uh, if it would be possible, if 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 there is any thinking about it. Even I would just throw yeah, well, such question. Well, uh, as Lino said, you can basically just use a compositor and then convert it there uh, into another space. Um, if you want to put it directly into a multi-layer EXR, for example, then probably there could be some kind of checkbox which outputs the path in a different. Or or the yeah checkbox anything switch. I mm. simply just because you know my norm my standard standard workflow is that i always uh, okay render to passes but i always render to multi layer exr and compositing is the next step i never composite during render i render then i import those files and composite them so i want to have the passes the correct passes yeah, in the when, when you're still composited you can still put uh, take the multi layer exr and then change it in the compositor because you still have access to no, the passes no uh, no no way in multi-layer EXR, we, I just have the colors. How on earth can I convert world space into 
camera space in compositing. It's impossible. Well, in, in the multi-layer, you have all the passes just like when you output it in the compositor. But I don't have the angles. It's impossible to convert from how? It's, well, yeah, you need math, you need a fake camera, you need whatever. So, so a lot of calculations. But if we simply had, because from the coding point of view, it's just a, you know, a little switch. And we wouldn't have to use fake cameras, drivers that drive the camera, link it to the something and so on. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah? Yeah, what? No, Blender internal, Blender internal uses the camera space. When you output normal pass from Blender internal, we have it in camera space. When we output uh, normal pass from cycles, we have it in the world space. It's different. But, uh, okay, so maybe the question, am I the only one who would want that? Maybe I'm the only one. <laughs> Oh yeah. I, I guess to to add to that what Martin said, basically in cycles we our, our common space or the space we are always using is world space. So I see. Okay. I guess that's just why it's why it was all also used in for the passes there because we use it everywhere. And, okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. I of course have my ways of uh, getting around this. This is not that you know I can work with this, but it could be a little bit easier. Thank you. Okay. Sure. Yeah, just a small feature idea. Will it be possible to render matcap materials, the default matcap materials in Blender for preview rendering or uh, sculpt preview renderings, some stuff like this? Yeah, well, um, you don't have access to those kind of things in the Cycles materials at the moment, but what you could do probably is like having some kind of OSL material for that or an OSL script which imports those GSL shaders and Basically, uh, GLSL and uh, OSL is pretty similar, so probably this could be done. But uh, yeah, there's no way you can access this at the moment uh, via our shader materials. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. It's another question for the passes, basically. Um, <laughs> there was a really, I mean, I, I usually work on stills, and there is a pass that I'm always missing with cycles, which is this pass that you get the object color uh, without any kind of shadow, any kind of reflection, anything, any kind of, so it's really easy then to go to Photoshop or GIMP or whatever and select that. And in the old Blender internal, you had a way of getting the matte, um, I don't remember the name, but this, the, the matte pass without the textures. And so far in cycles, as far as I know, it's impossible to get the pass without the textures. So I found like a couple of ways of getting it, but it's like hacking it a bit, using the scripts. And I think, uh, I, I, I mean, I have been uh, going around the Blender artist forums, and it's a thing that I have seen many times requested. And I'm, I'm, I'm aware of the ID mass, but you know that when you have a scene with, I don't know, 40 objects or 40 kind of different materials, you cannot spend one afternoon ma making the ID for a each of one. Will that be like really complicated? Or I mean, I, for me, I'm not a coder. It looks yeah, probably not. Um, I mean, we have the color passes already, but they they would be uh, with the textures. texture on top of it. So yeah, you just basically want the material without any textures then, so just uh, yeah. the plain color without textures. As I said, like I remember in Blender internal, there is just one. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, you check it and you get the pass without mm -hmm. the textures. I'm not sure if I'm. Will it be that like really difficult to do in cycles? Will probably uh, not, I guess. So yeah, we we could.
probably it's a bit difficult to extract. You would basically need to, to render it. I didn't hear. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> from here behind, we didn't. We didn't. I can I, I can I can show you examples. I mean, that I will be pleased <laughs> to to them. Actually, this would, would be great to select by object in my base level, like you. Yes, yes. And you have to select base. And there are some uh, nodes that you can make and materials you can you can make, but it's a, a turnaround. Yeah, but it's it's a turnaround. And yeah. usually, I mean, I'm, I don't want to create any kind of discussion here, but like. You want to make it easier for the user, and going to to use nodes and really complicated stuff that usually scares people. I mean, I, I work in architectural visualization, and you know, people are really you you want a, an an easy way because you you don't have much time to do these images, you know. So. Uh, I have a question about uh, the sampling and seeding uh, uh, procedure. I, is there a way to distribute the rendering uh, using the seed, the sampling seed, uh, so that you, if you have a large image and you can distribute on many nodes and then uh, fusion, fusion the, the results together at the end? Um, there's no automatic way uh, for doing that at the moment, but I mean, you can wait it with the compositor later on if you have like render it on one node with 100 samples, on an, or another node with 100 samples with a different seed, you can just combine them. So basically, I guess the correct way for that would, would just be a Python script. I'm okay. not sure if there is one already, maybe there is one, I think, yeah. And the so seeds are, are well distributed. Uh, what is the range of the seed? Uh, you can, uh, uh, for example, you can uh, decide, if, for example, if you have 1,000 samples, you can say, uh, I. I uh, you see the uh, seed number one to 200 uh, with 10 samples, it will be the same results as the... In theory, in theory it should be the same result, but uh, for those kind of things, I mean, when you have like a lot of, um, a lot of um, samples, I actually would recommend to rather split it in, in bigger chunks, like split it with 100 samples and then have it on 10 machines instead of having really small, small amount of samples, because then you eventually get a lower quality result out okay. of that, yeah. Thank you. Blender internal has a really, really great feature. I absolutely love it. It's called Halos, Halo, Halo material. When is this coming to Cycles? Well, Cycles is not Blender internal. <laughs> <laughs> no, but seriously, um, Halo is really, uh, really a fake, uh, fake type of material. and. Uh, I mean, Blender internal is really great for, for those kind of non-photorealistic things like uh, wireframes and, and halos and whatsoever. And um, I don't think that is something that we should add as a, as a real material type to cycles. So, um, I mean, when I look at the halos in Blender internal, it, it, it's kind of nice, but it's not what you would expect from a physically plausible render engine, I guess. So. Well, um, because um, when I first heard about cycles at FMX, I also had um, a talk to Tony, and he told me that Brecht was planning on implementing halos based on volumes, but now Brecht is gone, so um, I guess... Well, I, I don't know of any plans about it, but at least for me it wouldn't be a priority, and, or I, I would even go further and say that I don't think that this is something that should be in, in cycles, so at least it, it wouldn't be a priority for me to add halos. So. Okay. Uh, can we at least have point density textures? Well, that's what, uh, what the other question was early on, so having a voxel data or point density texture to load in volumetric uh, uh, shaders and uh, volume data, that's, that's of course something that we should add, yes. But in regards of potency, I'm talking about uh, really points like particles, and you have spheres that uh, cycles is computing spheres around the particles, for example, and uh, merges them like metaballs, or so just like the point density texture is doing in blend internal. Okay. Well, there are no concrete plans for that at the moment. No. Okay. So what I think is uh, that we should add the OpenVDB later, and uh, then have a good basis for importing volume data. But uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Please. <laughs> Uh, one question is: uh, Will there be a standalone uh, standalone cycles renderer as a separate program? So, for example, we can import from Maya files or from other 3D programs. 
So Cycles itself is standalone, so you can compile it as a standalone application already. The problem is that the API is not really uh, awesome yet. So, uh, um, well, as I said, Nathan Ledvory wrote uh, a C or I think C sharp uh, API for Cycles, which he put on GitHub, so people can look into it. Um, we uh, we maybe can merge some things of that and and use it uh, in master as well. Um, so yeah, long term the long term idea is to have a proper API which can be used by other applications and then they can basically write an, an import or exporter for their software and then you could put it in Cinema 4D or Maya or whatever. Um, that is definitely something that I'd like to see because I think there's a lot of uh, of potential for cycles out there. And we actually got a lot of uh, requests for that. And uh, every time I go to FMX, for example, there are people also from studios who say that it would be great to have cycles stand alone. But uh, yeah, it hasn't been a real priority for us yet to, to spend too much time on the API and stuff like that. But uh, yeah, it's definitely possible already. You can compile cycles without Blender. And you can load in uh, smaller scenes with uh, XML. But uh, to make it really useful, we would need a proper API, which can be used by the other applications then. Yeah. OK, thank you. Uh, Olivier? Can I have your question? Maybe here. Yeah. He was. But he, he was waiting for a long time. OK, yeah. But next time. Yeah. Yeah. I only have a small question. So yeah, sure. it's, it's only a very small annoyance. But is there a way to set the viewpoint color of a cycles material automatically to the <laughs> I don't think I need to finish my sentence even. The reason why this isn't in yet is because it is sometimes not so trivial to extract the diffused color from a node tree. Yeah, I can imagine. So when you have like a huge no node tree and you have like a, a few diffuse shaders, glossy shaders, uh, subsurface scattering whatsoever, which of the diffuse shaders is the color you want to see in the viewport. Yeah, I understand. So it's, it's difficult to find an algorithm which, which picks out that, that right color. Um, <laughs> random one every time you open the file. Mm. Of course, when, when, you, when you just have one diffuse node in the scene, yeah. then we could just take that. But when you have that, more that than one. That would be great, because I'm, I'm using it for research purposes. Mm. So I often have very similar characters. And it's just the blue one or the red one. Yeah. And that's the only identifying trait. And mm. if I then switch up cycles and go mm. to the regular viewport, they're all white. Yeah. So it's, Oh, well, I think that that can be done, but yeah, it's just complicated when you have a more a bigger I node tree. But yeah. for for those basic things, it, it should be very well possible. Yeah. Great, thanks. Okay. Well, it's, uh, at least one step forward. Thanks. <laughs> Uh, maybe it's a simple question, but I've got some scenes which I can GPU uh, render, but if I put them in a, uh, a scene which is built up of linked uh, models, uh, the GPU crashes. Is there a way of working out when, where the limit is, or possibly that there's some sort of warning that says if you go over this, then your GPU is not going to accept it? Well, basically, um, your program will always crash when it runs out of memory. It doesn't matter whether it's CPU or GPU. When you just run out of memory, it will crash. So um, you should um, keep an eye on the information on in the image editor, which says how much memory is being used on the GPU. Um, in, in practice, this is most of the time the number that you see there is, is below the actual amount that is allocated on the device. So when you have like one gigabyte, it might actually use 1.1 or 1.2 gigabytes. So you should see if that value is uh, near to the physical amount of memory you have on your card. And that is then, and, and usually you also get a, a warning in the console terminal of Blender when you, are, when, you, when you are on Linux, for example, when you launch Blender from a terminal, you should get an error message which, has, which says that it's out of memory. So you should check for that and then. And the, the render works it out through all the linked scenes. So if it's made up of 10 different scenes, it works out how much memory. It for the rendering, this is irrelevant. For the rendering, it still gets all the data from all the different blend files and then builds the scene in cycles. So that's it doesn't matter whether it's linked or not linked. It will still need to get all the data first and then calculate it. So the memory uh, memory information should be accurate for that case as well. Yeah. 
Any more questions? There's one in the back. There's another. Hi. Um, a few weeks ago, you talked about uh, cycles being the default render engine in Blender, and uh, it raised a, a big debate in the community. Mm -hmm. But uh, I would like to know uh, how far are we for from having cycles as defaults in Blender? Well, what did Ton say today? Defaults are stupid, so we shouldn't really worry too much about this. I mean, um, yes, I had a pretty strong opinion about that because it was basically planned for a long time and, and Brecht was also talking about it a year ago already. And then we always said, well, when we have volume and deformation motion, well, we, we consider it. The thing is there are, there are two things that I'd rather see finished before we evaluate this again. One is um, import and export of uh, data. So when you have like, uh, when you import or export uh, an FBX file or a Collada file, you also have uh, material information. And with Blender internal, those are more or less well being converted and exported, imported. We don't have that for cycles yet because that's again due to the fact that we have a node tree here and it's a bit difficult to extract textures and diffuse colors or whatsoever into a format. Um, so I'd like to see that being fixed first, or at least uh, some some workarounds or some some yeah some things that work with that. And the other thing is that I'd like to have some sort of presets or some kind of Uber shader, which was already planned. So so people only have to uh, when people open Blender, they just have a few, a few sliders, so they don't need to add certain nodes to get a simple shader first but rather they have a node group, for example, where they can affect the diffuse color and, and amount of glossy and whatsoever, so it's easier. So I'd, I'd first like to see those points being uh, addressed, and then we can talk about it again. But uh, yeah, I mean, I've seen the discussion as well, and uh, I think it's not a big deal. I mean, in the end, it's just one click, and uh, if you always use cycles, you can save your startup blend already, and it's, it's not a big deal. So yeah, first I'd like to fix those problems and then we can check again and see if it's feasible or not and yeah if not it's also not a big deal yeah uh, Martin you want to add something to that okay so your hand um, uh, I want to clarify on the GPU memory uh, issue one of the big problems we have is Nvidia the API actually doesn't tell us the total amount of memory we can only measure what we send in textures or in things but if you start up as soon as you start the render, the, the program is copied to your graphics card and that can allocate a few hundred megabytes, which we cannot measure. We cannot know this. There's no good way. Well, there is on enterprise cards, but not on GeForce cards to measure this. So this is a, a problem. Our measurement can be off by a 100 megs or 500 megs, depending on how, if you use an experimental cycles kernel on an old card, we can be off four or five hundred max at worst, yes. So you've seen might report one gig and we might be using 1.6 in the worst case. And then you get a crash because we cannot allocate memory. And, and we say, yeah, we only need a gig and I have 1.5 gig cards, but it still won't work. And there's no good technical way around this, unfortunately. Hmm? Yeah, 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 but <laughs> we cannot also reserve because memory is so precious. If you have a two gig card, you want to use as much as possible. So we, we, we also, because we cannot know how big this is going to be, we also cannot like cut you off before we crash, basically. And yeah, unfortunately, no real good way around that. And also your operating system, for example, if you if you use that card for the display as well, it will also need uh, memory already. So, uh, yeah, I mean, in practice, I really recommend, if you're really serious about GPU rendering, I really recommend cards with 3 or 4 gigabyte at least. Everything below that is today not not good anymore for for real big for real big shots. Yeah. So. Okay, so just one request: What about metadata on OSL shading? You know the metadata to describe the user interface of shading mm -hmm. of shaders. Yeah, that is something that uh, I'd like to see being added. Um, I unfortunately didn't had the time to do it, uh, um, but uh, yeah, it's definitely something that would be cool to have because it's a uh, yeah. Without that, it's sometimes it's a bit uh, you use integers to fake uh, booleans, for example, or whatsoever. It's a bit uh, annoying. It would be cool to have more 
uh, have a better UI for OSL shaders, yeah. So uh, I hope to see it uh, being added, but yeah, I, I cannot tell you when, when I have the time to add it, or maybe someone else wants to do it. it it's probably not a big deal, but yeah, I mean, it's, um, the OSL specification itself says how this should look and what information should extract from the OSL shader, so yeah, we just need a parser to get that from the OSL shader and make an RNA property or so from it and put it into the node interface, so yeah, hopefully we will have this uh, in the next few months as well. Yeah. Thanks. I have a sh short, uh, short question. Um, I was wondering if there's some kind of uh, transition uh, documentation. If, if you have uh, uh, complex scenes in, uh, in the Blender internal renderer and, and you want to transform that, that complex scene in, in, in a cycles ready uh, uh, s scene, uh, is, there some, is there some documentation with, with, with some steps or guidelines uh, uh, how you can do that uh, in, in, in a smooth way? Because of, uh, in this way, uh, when, when I switch uh, switch to the cycles renderer, then you have, you, there's a lot you have to, to, to adapt and change, and and that that's that's uh, yeah uh, a barrier or, or a step too far to 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 to, to, uh, to transition to the, the cycles renderer. Well, that's a very wide question, actually. I mean, yeah. it really depends on uh, on the scene. So, uh, of course, we you could uh, you could have some sort of documentation which tells you when you have like a shader with a diffuse material and image texture what you need to do in order to have this in cycles. But when it ca it, there are so many things that you have to consider when when you're comparing those two engines. Like, uh, f for example, um, it, it's it doesn't really matter for Blender internal if you have like an interior or exterior. Uh, for cycles, it's the less memory, uh, the less geometry geometry you have, the better. And uh, sometimes I, I've seen, uh, for example, there was one scene I, I saw in Blender artists once, where someone had um, an office desk, and he rendered that office desk, and you couldn't see anything around it, but he actually put a a, a room around it, so it has it had walls and everything, and uh, it was pretty slow, um, because he thought like, okay, well I can just do the transition and just adapt it to cycles, and I keep the room and everything although I only see that particular desk in my render. And uh, it was very noisy and slow, and I, uh, he provided the file for download, and I just removed the, the room and just kept the, the desk, and it was much faster and uh, less noisy. So there are a lot of things that you have to consider, and it really depends on the scene. Um, so yeah, I guess if someone wants to make a tutorial about that, uh, there is uh, demand for it. So, but, uh, <laughs> Yeah, it's it's really a wide topic, so it, it really depends if you have like an interior shot and exterior shot characters, uh, complex materials, you cannot really write one single guide for that. That's impossible. No. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, perhaps I'm just being particularly stupid, but are there any good introductory tutorials or explanations of what some of the nodes mean mm -hmm. in cycle system? Because I've read, you know, the wiki from top to bottom, and it's, some of them are still completely cryptic, or worse, you know, really just confused. They make no sense to me at all. Mm -hmm. But then I, I, I come from like a physics background rather than a ray tracing background, mm -hmm. so I'm seeing things in the opposite order. Okay. Yeah, I guess the wiki could be improved uh, for the notes, and maybe we could also add some examples there what the, what the notes are doing. Um, but yeah, maybe when you look at uh, Usually you can just look at tutorial sites like CG Cookie, for example, and, and look the, watch the cycle tutorials there. I've looked. For example, the, <laughs> the, the Shader Forge, the Shader Forge series on CG Cookie is really nice at the moment where they build procedural textures with lots of nodes, so you can learn a lot from that, for example, but yeah, some, some better guide would be nice. I, I, I suspect I am atypical here, mm. so not typical at all. Um, I like things systematic. I find these, we'll do a tutorial for how to do this particular scene, very hit and miss for what particular things they need for that particular scene. Actually, I quite like textbooks. You know, just give me a list of all your nodes and tell me exactly what they do and how I should model them in my head, and I'll be very happy. <laughs> just wanted to ask if it's possible that um, you see in the material notes um, 
you, you, you can um, grab the texture you made in the texture, but you don't see the name, or? Uh, in the note editor? Uh, yeah, in the note editor. You always see only text, but I, I don't get, like in, in the Blender internal, you could also associate this material has this texture. Okay. So, but I don't see it in the note editor. Mm -hmm. Well, then the note itself, when you add an image texture, you test on the, the name, of course, of the uh, image texture that you add there. Yes. Maybe a uh, preview would help there for adding textures in the mm -hmm. node editor. Maybe okay. that would be something. Okay, I guess we have to wrap up it, uh, wrap it up here then. So uh, thanks a lot for the questions, for the Cycles feedback, awesome. and uh, yeah, I hope you enjoy Cycles and uh, keep using it. And thanks for attending here. Thank you. <laughs>